Um, next up is uh, Ramesh uh, Thakur, um, who is uh, direct, director for the Centre for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Disarmament in the Crawford School. He was Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations from 1998 to 2007. Um, he's going to reflect on the year of COVID, uh, and um, he's covering a lot of stuff. So, Ramesh, uh, welcome, very welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll start my screen as well. Yes. Uh, so over to you. Uh, take us through your presentation. We've got, I think we've got an hour set aside. Um, so take as long as, as you need um, and we'll have some questions at the end. Okay. Uh, just checking that I'm on and you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can Great. see you. Uh, well, good see afternoon you. to everyone in New Zealand and Australia and uh, good evening, good morning to your global audience. Uh, first of all, can I just thank the organizers? It's a privilege to be in this symposium with some internationally eminent people. Uh, as you said, my, and my, my title is Reflections on the Year of the COVID. And just thinking back uh, on what has been a very strange year, especially for those of us in Australia, a year ago, I really didn't think that 2020 would be worse than what we had gone through in 2019. Uh, but of course it has been, so we'll see how we go. I'd like to begin with the fact that it seems to me firstly, even now, there's a lot of scientific uncertainty and no one really has a grip on it. Uh, and we see this, uh, ex this expressed in very various, various ways when uh, puzzled scientists say, well, why did our predictions not come true? Or what have we done wrong sort of thing? Uh, and the second preliminary comment, uh, bearing in mind, I'm not a medical scientist, not even a scientist, but I come to this from a purely a policy point of view. Uh, the second thing to bear in mind is that I'm deeply skeptical that decades worth of accumulated science can be negated by the experience of one, one province in one country in one month, uh, especially when with regard to data reliability uh, and the brutal suppression methods, uh, any effort to mimic that really should have come with very uh, strong health warnings in replicating that method and trusting the data that we got. And that has informed my perspective from the start uh, so that I've tended to substitute excitable question marks, the excitable uh, exclamation marks uh, with question marks. You know, where is the data? Where is the evidence? Uh, why do we want to go down this path? Especially as this has been the most intrusive effort at state control uh, in Western history, uh, more draconian even than during wartime. Uh, and I don't know about others, but I have deep problems with that. I'd like to understand why the state is taking away my liberties and freedoms uh, before I consent to it. Uh, and that's what I've tried to puzzle out. Ramesh, um, are, are you intending to put a presentation up or? Is this, can you not see that? No, not the moment. We're looking at you, not the presentation. Just sort of ah, check. It should have been share screen. So let me just yep. see if I can get, escape that. And uh, here we are. How's that? Yeah, got it. Uh, it's not in presentation mode, but we can see your screen. Why couldn't you not see this? I oh, know we can see, we can definitely see it. Yeah, but you, do you see the screen that says the WHO report? Yes. Good, okay. I'll put that in full screen then. Interrupt me if it disappears again. Okay. Now we've got it. It's looking good. Okay. I'll, I'll just go back to the previous one so you know what I was talking about, if I can. That was the science denialism. So I'm on to this one. There's a whole series of reports from epidemiologists and public health specialists and even the government authorities from all over the world, culminating just before we had the outbreak of COVID in this official WHO report in October, which I imagine most of the audience uh, would be familiar with, which really summarized the state of the art with respect both to what they were prepared to recommend, and more importantly, what they didn't recommend, which included some of the harsh mitigation measures uh, that have been brought in uh, in the name of lockdown. So really, we went against the existing science, except for two interesting groups of people. One, the East Asian states that have actually been, I think, the most successful given the circumstances and the geography and the, uh, and the season. 
are those that had learned their lessons from earlier outbreaks like SARS and avian flu and put in place various plans that were activated with great efficiency and very swiftly. Uh, and they went through that. And the second most prominent Western country that stayed with the existing scientific knowledge, of course, was Sweden. Uh, and at the very worst, their COVID performance is in the mid range in Europe, but they have avoided many of the uh, co harmful consequences uh, as a result. So I think it's, in a sense, the year's experience of actual observable data has vindicated and validated the consensus that existed before we went down this path. And of course, this was reflected in a series of national pandemic plans in the case of states and federal systems, state pandemic plans as well. Uh, I've got the UK up. Some of these slides I'm going to rush through because of time. Some I will speak to in more detail. Uh, with the UK one, I'm going to just skip over this and come to this one, the third one on that, where you can see that with regard to international travel restrictions, internal travel restrictions, and restrictions on mass gatherings, the existing pandemic plan drawn up in 2011, reaffirmed in February last year, so a year ago, emphasized a skeptical attitude to these severe restrictions, and yet they abandoned all that. And that we've seen in country after country as well. Just have a series of national plans, and as soon as the crisis hits, instead of activating them, you shove them aside, driven by panic and fear more than anything else. A second comment, looking at the observational data, to me what is most striking is how geographically bound this is. Europe, North America and South America have generally had a much worse COVID mortality uh, rates compared to their shares of global populations. Uh, by contrast, Africa, Asia, and all of us here in Oceania have had significantly lower uh, mortality with COVID compared to our population shares. Uh, and, and that's why, uh, to me, Australians boasting of how well we've done by looking at Europe and North America, I'm sorry, but that to me is a residual culture cringe where we look at inappropriate benchmarks for how we've done. We, in fact, are squarely in the middle of uh, where our regional performance falls. And I don't think we need to be, uh, we are not justified in being very boastful about that. The second thing that everyone knows by now, but doesn't actually act on with regard to responses is how strikingly age segregated it is. Uh, Jay went through that uh, in the previous one, uh, and he was talking in particular about these survival rates. Uh, and, and we've known this from day one, just about, but certainly for at least a year, and this is something that distinguishes COVID very strikingly, for example, from the Spanish flu, uh, that for people over 70, it is significantly worse uh, than the average seasonal flu, even a bad one. Uh, but for people under 70 and the younger you go, the, the more striking this becomes, it's actually not even as bad uh, as the average seasonal flu. You think this would have suggested to people from the start to have an age segregated risk assessment and response strategy, exactly as Jay was arguing, exactly as they've argued in the Great Barrington Declaration, the folks production argument. Uh, but in fact, they haven't uh, done that. Uh, and that's very puzzling to me. Similarly, the latest uh, Imperial College models, uh, I've seen one mathematics uh, graduate student, I think went through the things and they assume that there is no seasonality to the, uh, to the infection from COVID, which just seems very bizarre to be basing it on that assumption at this stage in time. And here again, you see the seasonality in the Northern hemisphere, when it uh, goes down in the Southern hemisphere, it goes up. Uh, I would expect therefore, as we head into the Southern hemisphere, autumn and winter, we'll see decline as we are seeing. In fact, we have seen declines in North America uh, and Europe, and we'll see a surge again uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So given that we seem to be locking down uh, for one case and two, case, uh, two cases here and there, uh, it, it doesn't look too good uh, for us in Australia at the moment. Again, a most important conclusion looking at the actual data over the course of the year 
is the extent to which infection, hospitalization, and mortality curves are policy invariant. It doesn't matter what policies are adopted. The curves mimic each other, whether you're in harsh lockdown, moderate lockdown, or modest to no lockdown. And this is again from a paper, in fact, that Jay and colleagues did uh, not that long ago, uh, last month. The parts in red, we failed to find strong evidence supporting a role for more restrictive non-pharmaceutical -pharma interventions in the control of COVID-19 in early 2020. We cannot completely rule it out, but even if the association exists, these benefits may not match the numerous harms of these aggressive measures, therefore more targeted public health interventions. You maximize the benefits, minimize the harms. That's the key equation, and that calls for targeted rather than these blunderbuss uh, NPRs that we've seen in the name of lockdowns. But people have been surprisingly resistant to accepting what's before their eyes. So then we look at graphs that are easily available. This is from the Blavatnik School. Uh, 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 and, well, this is from Johns Hopkins, really. But you see again Sweden in the middle of the European thing, and you see Belarus, Finland, and Norway at the very bottom. They really, in the past few months, no lockdown to soft lockdown countries. Uh, of course, this is a selected one, but these conclusions in terms of the association do seem to hold when you look at all of them uh, together as well. The interesting thing about Sweden, of course, is every time you mention it, the lockdown zealots or the cult believers in lockdown counter with, well, what about his Scandinavian neighbors? It's done a lot worse than Norway and Denmark and Finland. Well, the interesting thing is, if you look at the stringency index from Oxford and our world in data, for seven and a half months, since 22nd May last year, up until 6 January this year, all the other three stringency indices were actually below that of Sweden. So they've been softer in their approach than Sweden. And this, for reasons I don't quite understand, has failed to register in the public discourse. So in fact, their own argument can be thrown back at them. Yes, let's look at Sweden's neighbors. They've done even better by having still less restrictions on their society. And that's worth pointing out because I think it does counter that argument effectively. You get the same thing in the US states. It doesn't seem to matter what their policies are state by state. The curves mimic each other's, uh, the infection, the hospitalization in this case, mimic each other to a remarkable degree, again, suggesting as Alex Berenson put it, virus gone a virus, doesn't really matter what you do by changing the incentive structure for human behavior, you change human behavior, you don't change the behavior of the virus. That seems to be, as I said, to me, one of the strongest lessons that comes out uh, of global experience from uh, for the entirety of last year. Again, looking at the US states, all the states in a different chart, the blue codes are those that went into winter lockdown. The red are the ones that didn't go into winter lockdown. You see how they are spread all over the, the, the chart uh, on, on the x-axis. And in fact, the stuff five worst story. performers on mortality count are the five that did go into winter lockdown. And then you've got the average thing, which is not a very significant difference uh, between them. Or if you like, in terms of individual examples, think Florida and think New York together as well. So again, the same phenomenon there. With regard to masks, and this is one of these memes, if they are so deadly, if you don't wear masks, how come all of us, all of us non-mask wearers are not already dead? Uh, and you can look at it individually with regard to countries, how curves rose quite substantially well after and for a sustained period after mask mandates were introduced because of the seasonal autumn and winter surge. Uh, or you can look at uh, the last one, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's there. You, you, again, the, the curves mimic each other with no regard to whether the countries uh, were mask mandated uh, or not. Uh, it's again, policy invariant, as I said earlier. 
And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that it's very difficult to get people to follow the correct protocols with regard to mask wearing. Here's a political rally from India with a mask mandate. Some people have it on properly. Some don't, don't have any on at all. And about a third of them have it down to the chin. And you can see because they believe they have the mask, they're safe and therefore they mingle in very close physical proximity uh, to one another. Uh, and India, of course, has been, again, uh, one of the great anomalies in the actual results uh, compared to the impossibility, really, of imposing uh, physical distancing and, and social uh, distancing requirements in the country. Uh, and the only plausible explanation is the wide prevalence of a population immunity, both pre-existing and as, as a result of much greater infection uh, of, uh, by COVID than you pick up in the official statistics. And that has given Indians a degree of a population immunity, uh, which is showing through in the declining curves there. So the masks again, seem to be pointless uh, for that purpose. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a tweet from the CDC, which points out that in Delaware, universal mask use helped reduce COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. The problem was the period they were looking at was March to June. And Tom Woods took up Delaware and Pennsylvania. And, and one of the reasons for this is if you look at Delaware, the CDC study ends at the end of June, which is a summer downslope for the curves. And then of course, come autumn and winter, it shoots up without the mask mandate having been lifted. And the second thing he pointed out in this, and the reason for the comparison with Pennsylvania is that the Pennsylvania mask mandate comes in uh, 10 days or nine days before Delaware, but the curves again go in their own time sequence independent of the date in which the mask mandate uh, is introduced. Now, Tom Woods is a libertarian. I thought, well, maybe he's promoting an agenda. I got this from his new newsletter, but in preparation for this symposium, I went back and checked on my own. And here's the actual curve for Delaware. When the mask mandate comes in, when the CDC study ends, down from 235 to 89 cases, but on 12th of December at peak, there's 826 cases. Now, the CDC tweet was actually on 6 January this year, and they restricted their comment to the end of June. Given that this graph is widely available to anyone who's interested, that to me seems to be an example of deliberate dishonesty. Had they tweeted this in July, okay, they didn't anticipate the seasonality. But for them to be tweeting this in January this year and saying this shows how the mask mandate works and ignoring the very big spike for a sustained period afterwards, uh, that leaves me suspicious about the good faith intent of that tweet. And there's the same thing again more recently when they pointed to 10 states in which there was a 5% fall in hospitalization between March and October last year. Well, again, that's just as the upsurge is starting. And if you take the curves for the same 10 states, you can see how they went up quite steeply and then came down again. So again, this seems to me an example of politicization of science by a peak scientific institution in the United States. And that leaves me uh, quite troubled about how they operate. Also in looking back at the year, for my purposes, the headline of the year, is this from Politico on 23rd uh, December, if I remember rightly. Uh, yes, it is 23rd December. Lockdown California runs out of reasons for surprising search. And you'll have seen that now that the governor is facing recall, uh, he's starting to lift restrictions, even though uh, pretty much all the metrics he used to justify it in the first place, they are in a worse place today than they were when the uh, restrictions were brought in. So again, an example of uh, the data not matching the modeled uh, predictions uh, and likely curves. All of which ends up for me with a very 
simple policy question. What is the acceptable level of mortality risk relative to the damage to health, mental health, society, economy, disadvantaged sectors, and poor countries from the mitigation and containment policies? And it does seem to me that we have overwhelming evidence that the net harm of the costs of lockdown vastly exceeds the net gain between the less restrictive and the harsh interventions. And I'm deeply, deeply troubled by the refusal to engage in transparent, public, whole of society, cost benefit analysis, which shows the net benefit rather than harm of the strict lockdown policies on this balance. It's not as though they're showing that the trade-offs are worth it. They're not even engaging in the balance uh, of interest analysis. And to me, uh, for those who are decision makers and the health experts, this is really tantamount to criminal neglect, considering the scale and longevity of the harm that is being inflicted on our own societies, but particularly on the poorer countries and the poorer people in the poorer countries. And all for what? The total number of deaths with COVID, without even getting into the argument about the difference between with and from COVID, the total number of deaths last year still amounts to approximately 3% in round figures of all causes mortality for all of 2020. There's several other causes that have been deadlier than COVID, even in last year at a global level. Uh, and of course the ranking uh, in terms of where COVID falls changes on a country by country basis. But from a global point of view, uh, this is, a good question to ask. Why have we reacted in the public coverage and debate and government policy as if the numbers killed by COVID or with COVID exceed all other causes combined and have turned national health services into national COVID services only? New Zealand and uh, for your audience, I mean, you know, but for your audience, I actually have very strong New Zealand connections uh, in my life and continue to have so see where COVID falls in terms of the number of causes of death that are significantly higher uh, than COVID-19. And again, while preparing this, because I've spent uh, 15, 16 years of my life in Dunedin, in Otago, I still occasionally read the local paper there, the Otago Daily Times, and I was struck by this. The same number of people killed on the road in Otago and Southland which is an extraordinary thing uh, to say. And in fact, uh, a couple of days ago, I don't know if, how many of the non-Australians realized this, a couple of days ago, we had a truck driver killed in a fiery uh, crash on the border between Victoria and South Australia uh, because they have these border restrictions and he was driving at night. This happened about half past two in the morning. Uh, they had the trucks lined up, backed up, uh, and he just crashed into a truck in front of him. Uh, the last death with COVID exactly, uh, uh, precisely, I think, was late December or early January. Uh, so for over a month, this is the only fatality across the country in Australia associated with COVID and is called, caused by the border closures uh, that have been imposed by the state premiers. Uh, so that's something that puts it in perspective, uh, in human perspective as well. This is a drawing, by the way, from a 16-year-old girl in Alberta in Canada, who, if you go to the center of that, protect our healthcare system and the body bags from all the other causes uh, that we just ignore uh, and just blame shift uh, to something else. So effectively, uh, and in the UK in particular, it is bizarre that the, their slogan is save the NHS. I mean, <laughs> those of us with strong, social democratic instincts will always believe that the purpose of a national health service was to save us from disease and not for us to save the national health service. Uh, and they've succeeded in turning it around and saying, it's our fault if we get sick, we're not doing enough to protect the NHS, uh, which is a complete perversion uh, of what the correct relationship should be. And of course, there's this very strong emotional manipulation 
This is actually from the UK uh, government ad for COVID. Can you look them in the eyes and tell them you're helping by staying at home? Tell them that it's not a serious disease. Well, if you're going to do that, then the equivalent would be any one of these. Look them in the eyes and tell them why the mother committed suicide or why the mother couldn't uh, go in for a cancer operation and died waiting for that and, and all the other things that follow as that. And this sort of emotional manipulation, uh, I, I just find equally contemptible from both sides. I think we should be able to have this conversation as responsible, mature adults based on uh, logic and science and evidence without resorting to this sort of uh, very callously cruel uh, emotional manipulation. And of course, you see that with regard to Captain Tom Moore as well, who came back from a holiday overseas, tested negative for COVID, contracted pneumonia, goes to hospital, tests negative, picks up an infection in hospital, dies, and under UK rules, his cause has to be listed as a COVID death. Uh, and, and we've had this very substantial element of nosocomial deaths in hospitals in the UK, uh, and <laughs> this unwittingly uh, ironic thank you NHS from the funeral directors results from that. And I think in a very substantial sense, rather than as a clever gimmick, this conclusion from Dr. Dr. Max Strauss, uh, a Canadian doctor who's at my former, uh, at my alma mater, Queen's University in Canada, I think he's right. If lockdowns were a prescription drug for COVID-19 treatment, the FDA would never have approved it because the balance between the gains, demonstrable gains, and the demonstrable harms just don't add up. And so my conclusions broadly align, not you won't be surprised, uh, very strongly with that of the Great Barrington Declaration. First, do not do more harm than good. Protect the vulnerable. COVID-19 is now endemic. It will keep returning and mutating. Overall goal of public policy should be managing risks, not avoiding them, not denying them, and not aiming to eradicate them. I'm glad Jay spoke about how we uh, seem to have transitioned from three weeks to flatten the curve to protect our health system uh, from being overwhelmed uh, into a zero COVID policy. Uh, I think it's Sir Charles Walker MP who said in an interview, a couple of days ago in the UK, that it's not so much that they've moved the goalposts, they've ripped it up and planted it right across in a completely different playing field. Uh, fear and hysteria is never a good basis for policy development and implementation. I think instead we need to get back to emphasizing history, context, balance, and proportionality. We've had pandemics in the past, some worse than others. This too will pass. And governments must, and I think media and public commentators should, project calm, competence, and composure instead of panic and hysteria. Uh, and we've seen another one uh, in Australia yesterday uh, in the state of Victoria. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, uh, some questions are arising from that. Um, your own experience in, uh, well, you, you mentioned about the stat CDC tweet, which I hadn't seen. Um, I'm certainly not watching everything the CDC does. Um, but it, it was very surprising to me that that they would that they misuse the data like that. I mean, it's an, it's an official organization. And when you talk about um, the, the trouble with uh, this sort of emotional debate, uh, I mean, it, you'd expect institutions not to be entering into that. Uh, I'm wondering what your own experience in the UN um, might tell you about why international organizations are prepared to misuse, misuse information or, 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 or show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean to get the UN at all. I'm just wondering what sort of, can you understand what motivations are going on inside an organization to do that? Well, the first and most important thing to remember about the United Nations is that there is not one United Nations. Mm. It's a multiplicity of entities, each with its own balance of interests and values and core constituencies. And the chief executive of all the important ones and even the not so important ones 
they are chosen on the basis of principally political criteria, not efficiency and effectiveness and goal orientation results criteria. With that in mind, on the one hand, we have the WHO, which is, remains indispensable and essential as the global health standards and monitoring and advice, technical advice giving organization. But its performance has not exactly been stellar in this uh, from the start up until recently with regard to the inquiry they conducted and the report, in which of course uh, your own Helen Clark is involved very closely. We'll see how it happens. But on the other hand, I think, again, to put the UN in perspective, some of the best, most authoritative warnings about the long-term impact of the lockdown measures, particularly on the poorer people, on the children, uh, on, on, on women, have come from within the UN system, from the Food and Agriculture Organization, the impact of uh, global hunger because of the disruptions to the food production and, and global distribution networks. Uh, the thing from the uh, World uh, Food Program, uh, things from UNICEF. Uh, these are all, as I said, authoritative UN studies, which is important because it is not so easy to delegitimize UN reports mm. as coming from right-wing reactionary institutions. The UN retains a degree of credibility around the world that no other institution has. And so it is important to be able to point to these reports as coming from within the UN system. And that's where the WHO credibility comes in as well. So this legitimacy, this convening capacity, this ability to speak to the world's conscience, to mobilize resources and help the people who've been most harmed, all that is still there with the UN. So I think it's important that we take a critical perspective where that is warranted and ask for change, but not throw the baby out with the bathwater as far as the totality of the UN system is concerned. Mm. Um, what is the UN and Just doing? hang on a sec, I'm going to close my door because there's someone doing a weekend. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Sorry, yeah, go on. That's okay. What do you know? What the UN is doing uh, in particular to uh, to address uh, any of this? To get, I mean, I'm interested in what you're saying in terms of those reports, um, although they're not really being pushed all that hard. Uh, are you aware of UN level legal challenges uh, against nations or against uh, international? Um... Well, starting with the Secretary General and and other bodies, they have highlighted the dangers to human rights from. Uh, oppressive measures by governments in the name of COVID as well. I think for understandable reasons, at the moment, the top priority is to get this under control yeah. uh, in, as, as, a, as a pandemic. Uh, once that is done, I think the other parts will come in uh, and almost certainly it will be the UN system, uh, including the World Bank as part of the Red Wolf system, uh, that is at the heart of efforts to restore economic activity to restore uh, social and educational policies, uh, to bring immunization. In terms of, for example, opposing vaccine nationalism, that that has been led by the UN system and has to be led by the UN system. Uh, and, and you've got this odd situation in the Western world where some of us who criticize lockdowns are attacked for being selfish and not being compassionate enough to our fellow citizens. And yet the same people demand a nationalistic response when it comes to vaccines uh, and ignore the, the, the requirement for vaccines uh, that might be, you know, we don't need it as urgently in Australia at the moment, for example, as some of the European countries are badly affected. But there isn't that same uh, unselfishness and generosity of spirit to our fellow human beings uh, when it comes to this. So it goes back to that. I think governments have succeeded in terrifying their people to a degree that is unconscionable. And poll after poll in different countries shows that the people believe the disease to be far deadlier than it actually is. Uh, and that's where I think we had, we should have had a balanced approach from the start. 
Yes, so many people are, you know, we said X people are in hospital without saying how many are in hospital at this time of the year, in any case on average. And as it happens in Australia and New Zealand, clearly our all cause mortality for 2020 is going to turn out to be lower than the average year. And that's a reassuring fact. But you'd think it's, this is a grim reaper that's coming after us and is relentless and we better hide under the bed and hide under the doona and come out only when the government says, okay, all clear. Well, it's a risky thing, but we can deal with it. Even at my age over 70, it's a, if I get it, I have only a 5% chance that it will kill me. At my age with any ailment, I'm prepared to take that risk. Mm. So let's live with that. Yeah. Um, just getting back to the WHO for a moment, in some ways, what you've just described about that, um, that crisis and the fear that's been driven by um, states uh, seems to have... Um, and had, the media. Yes, yep, for sure, has seemed to have hamstrung uh, the WHO in, in terms of it being its clarity around um, the, the fact that lockdowns aren't going to work. They've, they've spoken out of both sides of the mounds, really, on when you know, the moment they might say lockdowns, uh, be careful about lockdowns, and then, uh, but then they say states are doing really well with the ones that are using lockdowns. It, it hasn't been clear. Would you comment on that? Well, I think for the first time we have a WHO director general who's not actually a medical scientist. One. Two, pretty much all the senior positions in any prestigious UN entity is filled based on political lobbying and political pressure and, and all sorts of other considerations. Three, the WHO is vulnerable to the charge that a lot of its external consultants in particular have conflicts of interest. We came through this with one of the earlier crises. I think it was the bird flu or was it one of the other ones? where, you know, the Tamiflu vaccine that was recommended and governments bought that in huge numbers at great cost. And then it turned out we all had to throw it out. Mm. Uh, I, there has been a surprising lack. Look, of all the multinational firms, the pharmaceutical sector is the most notorious for having uh, scientists, and governments in its pocket. It has a massive, massive lobbying budget. Uh, why has there been such a downplaying of existing preventative and early treatment remedies that are cheap, widely available, decades worth of safety record behind them already, and go in for vaccines where profits have been privatized, guaranteed prices, multi-billion dollar contracts in advance, and risks have been socialized. Uh, we've written in indemnity to the pharmaceutical companies. So this emphasis on vaccine, I mean, much as all of us uh, who are rational people who welcome the vaccines uh, and hope that they are efficacious uh, and they can be made widely available. Nonetheless, this emphasis on vaccine has worked very well to the advantage of big pharma and big tech uh, and we have ignored some other treatments, even as supplementary or treatment until we have the vaccine that could have uh, helped alleviate the suffering uh, and perhaps prevent it for some people. So I think there's been that side of it as well. And this, I'd like to see a really serious investigation after this is all over into the nexus between governments, medical scientists and big pharma. Uh, that remains a concern to me. Uh, when we come out of it. Now, as I said, I'm not going, trying to take away from the fact that they've been brilliant in the speed with which they've developed vaccines. In principle, I don't object to the new technology. That's how science advances. And we get uh, major breakthroughs by going for new technological uh, solutions to that. Uh, I do still have worries about the safety trials that have been rushed and we'll have to wait and see. Uh, so in that sense, it's still in the experimental phase. But with all that, uh, there's still that question of, I think, to what extent was our public policy contaminated by the influence of big money 
from a sector that is notorious for such influence. Um, and, that, and I don't exclude the WHO from that. Right, right, okay. Um, you mentioned about some of the other treatments. Um, that's been an interesting thing in itself. Uh, I think a lot of conspiracy theories have, have been driven by that kind of response to the, the, um, the of doctors themselves who are, are using um, some of the things um, like yeah, ivermectin, yeah. and, and, and then, but it get, it, you know, it's squashed. Don't talk about that. Um, Which is a brilliant way of of, of uh, combating conspiracy theory, isn't it? As well, opposed to giving it more life. Look yes. on the on, on the medical side of it, I'm not going to get into. It. I, I don't know. I don't have the knowledge, expertise, and and I'm going to accept the good faith conclusions that come out from the medical community on that. But in terms of the public policy strategy and, and the media strategy and the big tech strategy. To suppress that, and you know, who would have believed that Facebook would take down the Great Barrington Declaration page? Because they're saying, well, it's going to be for people individually to decide, given their risk assessment, whether they want to take the vaccine or not. It's a legitimate comment. If you're a young person, maybe you're more at risk by taking the vaccine in terms of side effects than from COVID, given your very low risk on that. Uh, at my stage, if I want to travel and they make that a requirement, if it's safe, I have no problem. I, I have taken every single vaccine that was required of me uh, so far in my life, uh, including for travel purposes. I have no problem provided it's safe. But don't take the discussion down. That feeds conspiracy theories. Yes. It, it magnifies and amplifies. It, it drives all the criticism and dissent underground. And also respect my body, my choice. That's a good formula to have, even for this purpose. Yes. And I don't think we should be imposing coercion on that. Uh, so no, it, it's in terms of a PR strategy, that's exactly the worst possible way to go. It's very counterproductive. It feeds suspicions. It makes people wonder what is it they're trying to hide and suppress. And as Jay pointed out, I agree entirely with him. It's one of the great surprises of this, the extent to which instead of encouraging open debate so we can see all sides. And, mm -hmm. and governments in similarly should have had all sectors represented. Get the advice from everyone. Don't make it a doctor's only decision. And don't hide behind that. It has consequences for people across the board. Let them come in and give you their advice as to where the balance should be struck. And then take the decision. It's your job to govern, not that of the health expert. Ah, which brings me back to your starting point around um, the, the remarkable situation where there was no evidence uh, and no planning for lockdowns, um, but they came anyway. Um, wh what do you put that down to? It, it felt instinctive. It felt like somehow it was the only thing that, well, in terms of the way the governments were responding. That yeah, well, I think three things happened. Yeah. Maybe four things. Firstly, I think... We looked what happened in China and we were unjustifiably impressed by the lockdown strategy. Before the virus spread and hit us, we said, you know, look at how brutal they are. Once the virus hit us, we said, oh, how brutally effective were they? Maybe it has to be a case of tough love. We should follow their strategy. One. Two. I still cannot believe why governments took Neil Ferguson and the Imperial College model at all seriously, given his previous track record, mm. and why they continue to take him seriously, unless they want now to propagate fear. Because he's got an excellent track record in stoking fear. But, but any resemblance between the predictions for best and worst case and actual reality is entirely coincidental. So I, I, I can't understand that part. But this early prediction, 510,000 deaths without mitigation in the UK, 2.2 million in the US. That had a dramatic impact. Third element, Italy in the early phase. The experience there and the images that came out of the overwhelmed hospitals and just how chaotic and terrible it was. And the fourth element in this, I think, was Boris Johnson personally being infected and coming close to death in hospital. So I think these four things converged 
into a perfect storm of panic and hysteria. And we threw out all existing knowledge, we threw out all existing plans and went in for this uh, insane policy. Uh, and it doesn't give me satisfaction to say that I've been skeptical from day one about this. And I've seen nothing so far uh, to make me change my mind about my skepticism on this. Uh, interesting point you make about uh, Boris Johnson. And if I remember rightly, in fact, early on, uh, a, a small group of other leaders also caught um, uh, the coronavirus, um, the, the Canadian Trudeau and a couple of others. So I think yeah. that, that may have helped to drive, drive what was already in their heads. It did. But the interesting thing is they all did survive. Yes. And, and in terms of visual representation, and this is important, for all his other faults, I was pleased that Donald Trump came out after that and started to act normally and didn't wear a mask. He said, okay, I've had it. I might still have a low risk, but it's going to be very, very low. I'm not going to worry about it. By contrast, you have Boris Johnson goes into another isolation, wears masks in public, instead of saying, well, let's get on with it. I've, I've suffered. I, I'm came near death, I recognize that, I'm very thankful to the NHS, but it does show that getting COVID, even if you're old and fat and unfit, is not actually a death sentence. So mm. that is a message that's opposite of what he has conveyed. And he's been just, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> if there's one leader who's been worse than Trump in his incompetence and flip-flopping, I think is Boris Johnson. Mm. Uh, it looks to me like what's happened from those things you mentioned. It's it's a nest of feedback loops um, between media and politics and medicine. Everybody's just reinforcing each other, and that's that's what seems to keep the whole show going. Um, and not paying enough attention to the countries that manage it successfully. Indeed, it, it, it's well, you know, one other. At least we in Australia and New Zealand shouldn't make that mistake. This no. is our part of the world. Yes. One other question. Um, how do uh, how does your family uh, and and others in India? I'm imagining you've got family still in India. Um, how how do how do you think they feel about the West and the West response? Do you know? uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I, I think the, the the paranoia spread very quickly in India as well. Ah. The lockdown on going back to the stringency index. If you look at that, late March when India imposes lockdown its index was rated at 100. It was harsh, it was brutal, and it had brutal consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the images you may remember of, of hundreds of thousands of migrant laborers walking home yeah. because all public transport had been closed uh, and many dying on the way uh, in, in very distressing circumstances often uh, and being sprayed by chemical disinfectants along the way as well. I think they started easing the restrictions month by month after the first couple of months because of two things in India. One, it became very clear very quickly that the damage to health services, to mental health, to uh, economic livelihoods, people saying, well, we're going to die of starvation before we die of COVID. Uh, most of your audience may not be aware but last year, the suicide rate in India jumped up by a big margin, not just marginally. And the number of suicides uh, was between 60 to 100% more than the number of COVID deaths. Now, I think we can take it that there's underreporting, but that can extend to both sides as well. So I think the realization of the damage on the one hand, and the realization that under Indian conditions, the social distancing is impossible. How can you practice social distancing in the great slums of Mumbai, where multi-generational generational families live together? One room has a bedroom for all of them. The other room has a living room and kitchen and dining room all combined. And all of them share washing and toilet and water facilities with 20 other families from a communal tube. Uh, and, and toilet. It's absolutely meaningless. Now, in that context, the, even with similar infection rates in the slums and non-slum areas in Mumbai, the mortality rates in the non-slum areas have actually been higher 
indicating that precisely because of these conditions, there's greater contamination and infection across the slum areas. And therefore the population immunity has spread much faster in the slums compared to non-slums. So you get this peculiar conclusion even from that. Uh, and all the studies, seroprevalence studies and, and things do indicate that the actual infection is much more widespread and therefore the combination of existing immunities, uh, the fact that Indians have been used to taking HCQ for anti-malaria treatment for a long time, uh, all sorts of other things, does indicate that surprisingly at the end, and of course there's a younger population too, but nonetheless, surprisingly and at the end, India is in many ways to me, more of a standing refutation of the lockdown argument than is Sweden. Wow, right, thank you. Um, that's it, uh, really appreciate it, Ramesh, that is wonderful. I do, I do recommend that people uh, search you out on the internet for some of your, um, some of your papers and uh, opinion pieces, they're, they're extremely well written. Uh, really appreciate you coming on today, thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thanks a lot. Everyone, we'll take um, 10 minutes. Uh, we've got uh, James Allen's coming on in, in 10 minutes uh, to a discussion about legal philosophy um, or his, his, uh, the legal issues that have been raised um, by COVID-19 and government responses. Um, so we'll give that 10 minutes and go for a break, grab something to eat and drink. We'll see you in 10. Thank you.